Shalom and welcome to Congregation Lador Vador. I am Rabbi Stephen Moskowitz and we are pleased you have joined us for this evening's talk, despite of course the weather outside. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to take this opportunity to offer a prayer. I recognize that our hearts are pained by the wars that continue to rage throughout the world and most recently the war Russia instigated against Ukraine. Humanitarian crises and profound suffering are found in far too many countries. This evening we will hear more about Afghanistan's travails. But given these past weeks and the suffering and war that is all too common, I wish to offer the words of our tradition before we begin. O se shalom bimramav, huya ase shalom, aleinu v'al kol Yisrael, v'akol yoshvei tevel, v'imru, amen. May the one who makes peace in the high heavens make peace for us, for all Israel, and all who inhabit the earth. And let us say, amen. Our congregation is proud to offer an array of interesting and informative programs. We hope to serve as a resource for learning and engagement, not only for our members, but also for the wider community. All are welcome to join us for our programs and services. So please join us for Shabbat services every Friday evening at 7 p.m. And our next program in our speaker series is scheduled for Tuesday, March 29th at 7 p.m. when I will be joined by Rabbi Mike Moskowitz, who is no relation to me, when we will discuss LGBTQ inclusivity. All of our programs can be found online on our website, ladorvador.org, our Facebook page, and our YouTube channel. This evening's talk, a tale of an Afghan interpreter a Conversation with Farid Ferdos is co-sponsored by Cornell University's Institute of Politics and Global Affairs. We are especially proud of our relationship with this institute and our partnership with Representative Steve Israel. We have learned a great deal from these talks. So let me introduce this evening's guests. Farid Ferdos was born during the height of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the early 1980s. And after the horrific events of September 11th, Farid was hired by the US Army as an interpreter and translator, given that he was one of the few people in Kabul who spoke English. He became close with Chief Warrant Officer Tim Mueller, who was instrumental in his receiving a visa, visa to study here in the United States. Farid almost immediately enlisted in the U.S. Army and deployed six times to Afghanistan between 2008 and 2017 in support of Operations Enduring Freedom and Freedom Sentinel. In 2021, he graduated from Cornell University where he studied government, Near Eastern Studies, and History. Mariah Smith serves as the Director of Government Affairs for Accrete AI Government, an artificial intelligence firm based in New York and DC with both commercial and defense clients. She retired from the Army as a military police lieutenant colonel in 2020. She was commissioned through Vanderbilt University and is a graduate of the FBI National Academy. She served three tours in Afghanistan and a tour in Iraq. And after serving as a Congressional Fellow for Congressman Steve Israel, she spent almost a decade as an Army le Legislative Liaison to both the Appropriations and the Armed Services Committees. She is also a Councilwoman for her hometown of Stevens City, Virginia, a growing community in the northern Shenandoah Valley. Steve Israel served as U.S. Congressman from 2001 to 2017 and now directs the Nonpartisan Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell University. He has published two critically acclaimed satires of Washington, The Global War on Morris, and Big Guns. As a member of Congress, Israel also served as a chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. 
Steve Israel is a regular political commentator on MSNBC, and his insights appear, appear regularly in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and The Wall Street Journal. He was profiled on HBO's Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, and has appeared on CBS's 60 Minutes. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest this evening, Fareed Ferdos, Lieutenant Colonel Mariah Smith, and Representative Steve Israel. Welcome, welcome everybody to the door of a door and to the uh, approximately 500 folks who've registered uh, for our, for our uh, broadcast, uh, Cornell, the Cornell community in the United States and around the world, welcome uh, to you. Uh, tonight, a very, very special program from two people that I've come to know quite well, actually. Farid Ferdos was a student of mine uh, at uh, Cornell University in a, a course that I teach. Uh, Mariah Smith, if three tours of Afghanistan and one tour of Iraq weren't challenging enough, she then served as a fellow in my office, which, <laughs> which made everything else seem pretty calm and tranquil. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell University uh, has one mission, and that is to deepen discourse and raise understanding of complex issues. I know we're getting a little bit of feedback, and thank you for correcting that, Rabbi. Uh, so we deepen discourse and raise understanding uh, of complex issues. We are a platform where we do not allow sound bites. We take the time that it takes with the civility and respect that is required to understand the volatile nature of the country, the volatile nature of the United States. We're also relentlessly bipartisan. Our past uh, speakers have included President Bill Clinton, Reince Priebus, who is Chief of Staff to President Trump. Uh, we have had uh, Congressman Adam Schiff. We have had Republican members of Congress like Tom Cole, Governor uh, John Kasich. Uh, and many others. Um, we uh, are right now exploring what is happening in Ukraine in the past two weeks. We have featured Bill Taylor, who served as the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine under President George W. Bush and the Chargé d'Affaires in the uh, U.S. Embassy in Ukraine under President Trump, and Bernard Henri Levy, the French intellectual. Uh, upcoming programs that uh, we commend to your attention on March 14th, coming up, a conversation with the former director of the CIA, John Brennan. March 22nd, a conversation with Huma Abedin on her book, Both End, A Life in Many Worlds. And we've just secured yesterday, we're waiting to schedule this, but I spoke yesterday with the former Prime Minister of Great Britain, Gordon Brown, uh, who has agreed to a conversation about international war crimes tribunals and other options that will be on the table with respect to President Putin and other Russian leaders. Uh, the, uh, which brings us to this evening. You know, the rabbi mentioned what has happened in Ukraine is a very snowy day, very inclement day on Long Island. And on Long Island and I, uh, throughout the rest of the world, uh, people have been riveted to the grotesque images that we witness in Ukraine. Today, a, a children's hospital, a maternity ward bombed. And we are properly riveted to those images. We should be riveted. The problem is that we're living in a world that's called VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And when things are volatile, the crisis that we're watching today is very easily forgotten by the crisis that will occur tomorrow. And the crisis and the images that we watched months ago have all but been forgotten by the crisis that grips us today. It was just in August of 2021 that we were riveted to images of people clamoring to escape Afghanistan when, we, when the United States withdrew. People clinging to aircraft, hoping to leave that country. People massing at a, uh, a facility uh, where they'd hoped that some outstretched arm would grab them and pull them across to safety. The job of the Cornell Institute of Politics and Global Affairs is to make sure that we're not allowing the images of August to be completely replaced by the images of today. We have an obligation to remember. We have an obligation to understand that these, there are people who still need our help, that there is a crisis that is still brewing. And tonight, we have somebody who lived through that crisis, who tells a riveting tale, who served his country, secured a bronze star, worked for the United States Army, kept our troops safe, 
came to the United States, went to Cornell University, but had to fight another battle to bring his family to safety. And that is the story that we want to share with you today. Uh, Mariah, I want to welcome you uh, as one of our conversants. I ask you to talk a little bit about your organization, how you've devoted yourself uh, to, to the plight of, uh, of folks like Farid, and then uh, why don't we have you ask the first question? Certainly. Um, very glad to be here tonight with everyone. I'm Mariah Smith, um, and now that I've retired from the Army, I help run an organization called No One Left Behind. And what No One Left Behind does is it's the only nationwide organization that is specifically focused on helping our Afghan and Iraqi translators that served with us uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, served alongside US troops. We do several things. We advocate um, for the process that Mr. Israel helped uh, put in place, the visa program. Um, we advocate to make it simpler, faster, to bring more people here. Um, and then we assist with resettlement once they're here in the United States. There are some wonderful resettlement organizations nationwide um, that are completely overwhelmed right now by the influx of Afghan refugees. And we fill in with direct financial assistance where government benefits end. And then the third thing that we do um, since August and the withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan is we continue to assist with the evacuation process because we see it as our moral obligation that we will not leave the people that we served alongside uh, behind in Afghanistan. Uh, so we're continuing to try and bring them there. Um, so I would love to hear more about you uh, fascinated us at dinner with your journey here and everything that you've been involved in to help the United States and Afghanistan uh, since 2001. Could you give some context and tell us about uh, your experience over the past 20 years and how you got here? Absolutely, it'll be my pleasure. Uh, thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity, uh, Representative uh, Colonel and uh, the congregation here, for allowing me to tell my story. I think it's an American story. It's a story that needs to be told. It's really not about me, but it's about people that made this opportunity, this, this opportunity possible for me. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for my adopted father, Tim Mueller, here today. He took a chance on me as a local Afghan interpreter in 2002, where Afghans were suspect because of the issue of September 11. But he brought me to his home in New York. He paid for my school. He sent me to school. I lived in his house. I ate his food. And then I graduated from a community college in Rochester, New York. And then I enlisted in the Army. And we've had this discussion. The fact is, I couldn't see myself doing anything else other than joining the Army as a local in Afghan interpreter from, from, from a lower middle class where I had lived through the horrors of the Afghan Civil War, through the oppressions of the Taliban. And the army for me was, 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 was an opportunity, not only an opportunity, but it was an organization that gave me a chance at a new life. Not only me, but a majority of the Afghans. So I was inspired by these officers that I worked with and I've been inspired today at, at my current age that I just couldn't see myself to do anything else. I was, uh, I was hired as a locally uh, uh, hired interpreter in December of 2001. I was barely 18 years old. I, you, you were born in Afghanistan? I, I was there, yes. Okay, and you lived through the I, Soviet invasion. Let's you, back up a little bit to put it into, into context. Absolutely, I was born in, um, uh, in the early 1980s. I lived through the, through the Soviet invasion, but we lived in Kabul where it was relatively peaceful. Uh, I did not experience the horrors that the Afghans experienced in the countryside, because that's where a majority of the fighting between the Soviets and the Afghans took place. But I vividly remember the fall of the Afghan government and not the fall of last August, the, uh, the fall of 1992 when the Afghan government fell to the Mujahideen and then Afghanistan descended into a civil war. I, well, we lived in Kabul and my father was a civil servant with minimum salary. So we lived through that from 1992 to about 1996. We traveled, we, we fled from one part of Kabul to another part of Kabul seeking safety and security. And then in 1996, Taliban took over. You were how old at, this, at the time? At, at that point I was about 13 years old. But I, I vividly remember the Taliban era because it was, the, Hopelessness pervaded throughout the country, especially for a younger generation where internet was becoming commonplace in the, in, in, the, in, in the United States and Europe, and our only access to the outside world was 
through radio because television was not allowed, listening to mu music was not allowed. And for young people like myself, that was soul crushing. We had no hope whatsoever during the Taliban. And then the horrific events of September 11 happened. This might sound heartless, but it was a moment of hope, uh, hope for, Afga for Afghans because that was the only opportunity or the, the first opportunity that presented itself where the international community came together to rid Afghanistan of the Taliban. It gave an opportunity to 30 million men and women that lived in Afghanistan for a better future. And I was lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to be part of that part of the US history. I was one of the very first interpreters that was hired in December of 2001, and I stayed on for as long as I possibly could. Thank you. So you were hired in December of 2001, just several months uh, after the attack. Uh, tell us about those early experiences and then how you advanced as an interpreter and translator. And describe for folks who may not be aware specifically what, your, what, what was a typical day like? I will not be exaggerating to say that the, the day I was employed or I was hired as a local interpreter in Kabul was one of my happiest days, happiest days of my life. And that was simply because I had an opportunity to contribute and contribute positively. The, 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 the unit that hired me was a civil affairs unit. It was a British Army civil affairs unit. They were responsible for assessing schools, clinics, bridges, roads, orphanages, and so forth um, to see where work needed, uh, was needed. So I volunteered to go with them to the furthest provinces that they were operating uh, to get an inventory of those projects. And on, on a personal level, it was a great opportunity for me because we were getting paid $550 a month as, as a salary, and that was an immense amount of money in Afghanistan. And with that money, my family had a comfortable life a life that they hadn't experienced for the 10 years prior to that because of the Afghan civil war and then the Taliban oppression. Uh, I was young, not, barely 18 years old, and I was inspired by the folks that I work with, folks in uniform. Um, I went to work very happy, very excited every day because every day was an ex excitement. It was an adventure. It was an opportunity for me to do the best I could. And, the U.S. Army offered me that opportunity to do that. Typical, if I may, and, and Mariah, jump in whenever, whenever yeah. you would like. Take us through a typical day. Because you were not just an, an interpreter or translator. You write in your, uh, your biography that you were assigned as Admiral William McRaven's linguist. I had the distinct honor of working with the Admiral for 13 months. During my initial deployment as a United States Army soldier, I had the honor of translating for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mullen, the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Lieutenant General Burgess, director of Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Vice Admiral Murrett, and the commander of US forces in Afghanistan, General Stanley McChrystal. You were translating for some pretty important people. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to have to be in a position where I interacted with a lot of senior uh, US military uh, commanders that were in Afghanistan or were coming through for, for various visits. Uh, my first interaction with a VIP was in uh, September of 2003. The very first provincial reconstruction um, or, uh, was, was opened in Gardez uh, province and uh, the late uh, Secretary of uh, Defense uh, uh, Donald Rumsfeld came through, so I had the honor of meeting him. And from there, it just, I, I suppose it was by coincidence, I guess, that I had the opportunity to meet these folks. And um, I'm not exaggerating to say that I've been inspired by every single one of these individuals that you mentioned, particularly Admiral McRaven. I had the honor of working with him in 2009 when he was commander of US Federal Operations Command. It was these individuals that inspired me. And as a young Afghan, um, they molded my life completely unwittingly, but um, um, I, I try to live my life based on the example that they've set for me. So tell us a little bit about, so you, you served first as a, a translator um, with British and US forces, then came to the US, lived with Tim, went to college, came here on a student visa, and then made the decision to join the US military as a soldier. Um, tell us a little bit about that transition and then your experience as a, as a U.S. military member. Uh, 
as, as, as I mentioned that, uh, I work for the, for, for the British Civil Affairs team and I worked with them for about five months. They were placed by a Civil Affairs unit out of uh, 401st Civil Affairs Battalion out of Webster, New York, where I had the distinct honor of meeting my sort of adopted father. I worked for him, um, also as an interpreter. Not only was my job working as an interpreter, but also providing cultural context, cultural insight, interaction with Afghans, because Afghans were very wary of, uh, of foreigners, especially folks in uniform, because of uh, uh, our experience with the Soviet Union and then later with various other mercenary groups that were com coming through Afghanistan. My job was to facilitate a, a, a smooth interaction. And um, in 2004, uh, uh, Chief Mueller uh, offered to sponsor my visa to come to the United States to study at a, at a community college. And uh, I was more than thrilled to take that opportunity and, and move here. Because of my work with the Army, there was only one thing I could think of was that how do I join the US Army? And that was mm -hmm. my only goal. Uh, despite the fact that I graduated uh, NCC in 2007, I had an opportunity to uh, go to a four year school, but instead I opted uh, to enlist in the Army. I, honestly, I just couldn't see myself doing anything else because of because of the caliber of people that I've interacted with over my uh, you know, few years of working as a vocal interpreter. You, um, let, let's, let's shift to the decision by the United States to withdraw. Talk, talk to us, tell us about where you are at this time. You mentioned at dinner, I believe, that you could see the handwriting on the wall. You had a sense of what, uh, what might happen. Take us through that process. Right after I graduated in May of 2021 from Cornell University, my goal was to study a little bit for the LSAT to go to law school, hopefully. But I followed the, I followed the Afghan news very closely, and I saw that things were not going well, partly because of the, the waning air support to the Afghan forces and also to the political statements coming from, from, from NATO allies and the United States that sustaining the Afghan government was not a possibility. And for me, who was invested in that, in that project, I sensed a degree of uncertainty that things were not going to go well. And that's when I realized, because, I ha because of my work with the Army and because of my work as a locally hired interpreter for many years, that my immediate family will be in direct ris risk because of what I had done. Tell us, if I may, forgive me for interrupting, but your immediate family is. Who, t tell us about the folks who were still in Afghanistan at the time. At, the, at that point, my father, who's uh, in his uh, 60s, and my mother, uh, who was also, uh, she's, she's elderly, and my sister, um, the rest of my folks live in England. Uh, they, the, the, my, my, my parents were there, and I felt a direct responsibility because anything, if anything had happened, it would, it would have been directly as a result of my work. So I started reaching out to people. The very first person I could think of was yourself, sir. I wrote to you and I asked you for assistance to see if there was a, an opportunity uh, to possibly expedite their case or to, for, for it to be looked at. And then I reached out to a lot of the veteran-supported organizations and they were incredibly helpful. I heard back from a lot of them. And um, from there, from June onward, July was, was a terrible month for, the, for, for Afghanistan because the Taliban, uh, sort of, uh, their, their operations had gained momentum and then the air support from the US side was waning and then unfortunately the events of August of 2021 ha occurred. I honestly don't remember much about those two months because I stayed awake most of the time. My only job or my only goal was to be able to ensure that my parents are out of Afghanistan. At that point, my goal was not to get them to the, to the United States because that was a lofty goal. My goal was to get them to the closest, safest country I can get them. My goal was to get them either to Tajikistan or India or somewhere or anywhere basically to, for them to be out of harm's way. Um, so, so I spent that two, two weeks basically working on that. And then when Kabul fell and then people rushed to the airport, because I could, I could feel their, their despair. And these were people, mostly the younger generation, the middle class in Afghanistan that were heavily influenced by the last 22 decades of the coalition's uh, present, uh, presence in Afghanistan. They were, they were, they were the younger generation who were, you know, uh, were very savvy with technology. They, they had hopes and aspirations. They were highly educated. They had traveled around the world. They had a particular vision for Afghanistan and that evaporated in, in that instance. And I could, I could feel their pain as everyone rushed to the airport. And among them were my parents too, uh, because I 
couldn't think of anything else to tell them at that point. But unfortunately, they were elderly, so they, through that chaos of entering the airport was a virtual impossibility for them. But through the first um, attempt, they were unable to uh, get through the, air, through the gate. And uh, several people were shot right next to them, and then I was trying to convince them and cons console them to see if I could you know, get them to go back. And you know, they were losing hope. They, they weren't going to try it for a second time. They went back to the airport again for a second time with my sister. That effort failed too. Um, at that point, I was getting not only disappointed, I was losing hope. Um, and, and I desperately you know, extended my net of reaching out to, to, to folks. And I reached out to our uh, elected um, representative in upstate New York. They were incredibly helpful. And, and I would reach out to you frequently, sir, to, to see if there was any update from, uh, from the White House to see if they could expedite that. Luckily, by some miracle, some of the special operations folks that I had worked with in, in the past, I reached out to some folks there and um, they were able to arrange for an extraction for my family. Um, an extraction, even though my f uh, parents didn't live that far from the airport, but uh, making it to a rendezvous point at, in the middle of the night and then you know, exchanging pass passwords were not an easy thing because Taliban had imposed a curfew in, in the city where people were not allowed. So I had to, looking at a Google map from my basement in Ithaca, I had to direct their taxi driver how to, to go from, from their hiding space to the rendezvous spot where they will uh, meet up with the extraction team and then from there enter the airport. And that was probably the hardest six hours of my life because the, the phone services were overwhelmed. I couldn't directly talk to them, so I would leave them voice messages directing the taxi driver uh, to take to, to you know avoid checkpoints and what back alleys they should take to make it to the rendezvous point. Thankfully, they made it to the rendezvous point literally five minutes before the before the closing window. Uh, but we were incredibly unfortunate uh, fortunate to be able to get them on time. And once they were safely on that bus, and the bus was stopped by the Taliban before entering the the, the, the airport, and my sister was texting me, and I have kept a log of the text messages, the despair in her voice saying that they're about to. Uh, break into the, to the bus and my inability to assist in any capacity. That, that was um, a, a horror that I lived through. Uh, but I was glad once they made it through the, through the gates at the airport. Uh, and I, then I slept probably for the next two days because I had stayed up for, for two weeks. I, I was out of the touch for, for the next two or three days. Once I was sure that they were at the airport safely. And they're safe now, thanks to the heroic and kind of anguish-filled effort that, that you and others um, invested in this. I attribute, I attribute their safety to, to a lot of people, including the representative here, your organization, No, no One Left Behind, and also individuals like him and um, folks like um, Admiral McClavin and other people who were instrumental in ensuring that this, this to happen. If it weren't for, for all these people that I mentioned, they would still be in trouble. They would still be undergoing through that because I, by myself, couldn't, in, couldn't do any of that. So I'm grateful for, for that. They were able to get on a plane um, on August 23rd of 2021. They were evacuated to uh, United Arab Emirates for two weeks and then from there they were flown to Dallas uh, and then they went through the uh, Marine Corps Based in Quantico, Virginia, for the next, uh, they were there for about two and a half months, undergoing security uh, uh, vetting and uh, medical t testing and so forth. And they were released to us in uh, November of 2021. They initially settled in Syracuse, New York, because that was the closest to Ithaca. And then we just recently purchased a place in uh, Rochester, where they will be moving. And I, uh, since I, Rochester was, was was the first place I moved to in 2005. I consider myself a Rochesterian. <laughs> well, we consider so you a Long Islander. I just <laughs> to Tell us, if, if you could, about the, the first contact that you had with them uh, in the US. Was it in Dallas, or did you have to wait for them to be vetted? The, the very first uh, call I received was, was from my sister, who was the main person that was helping my parents. My father is 67 mm -hmm. years old, and my mother is uh, about 65. So they had a lot of difficulties getting through the, through the process. But she was the one that I was communicating this is after they are in the US. I, at that point, I didn't know. I knew they had flown out of Dubai, but okay. I didn't know that they were here. And then I didn't hear from them for about a whole day, and that was nerve-wracking. I didn't know what had happened. 
But I got a call from my sister and I could hardly hear and all she said was that she was here <laughs> in the US and to me that was the greatest news that you could, one could possibly have. There, uh, frankly, there are no words to describe that joy that once they were here, th that was it. My responsibility as a son was over from that point on. <laughs> and when and where did you first see them? The first opportunity we met them was, uh, Tim was with us too, uh, we greeted them at the uh, airport in Syracuse, New York. It was a typical Syracuse day, rainy and cold. <laughs> Unlike here on Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> but we were glad, we were beyond thrilled, beyond, beyond uh, you know, any words can describe that they were safe and they, I could look after them from that point onward. So they're now safe, but Mariah, you are a leader in an organization that still works for so many who have been left behind. What, do you, what, what are the numbers, Mariah? So on, on our database alone, and our organization specifically focuses on um, people who were translators for US military that came, that are due to come to the States through the Special Immigrant Visa Program. Our database alone is 52,000 people. Um, and there are thousands and thousands of more Afghans that are also deserving because of their work with the Afghan government, their work as journalists, their work um, with medical communities as educators. Um, so our small piece of it, 52,000 people, um, there's, there's so many more that um, you know, deserve a, a safe future. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you, you know, what, what your parents went through and what you went through to get them here, um, what are some actions or policies you think that, that we could change that, that need to happen to, to make it easier, to make it, I mean, because it, it's certainly easy, you know, there was nothing easy about it. What are some things that, that you think need to change? Well, as someone who was in the army, and the very first ethos that we live by is we never leave a fallen comrade behind. That's, that's an ethos we start with from basic training and onward, and, and I try to live by that. Unfortunately, we have left some people behind, and I know someone who's very dear to me, also an Afghan SIV recipient, bronze, bronze star recipient, deployed to Afghanistan multiple times. His father, his mother, and his disabled brother, who's uh, under the age of 21, are still stuck in Afghanistan. They made it to, to, tried to make it, make it to the airport, unfortunately were unable. And I know another very close friend of mine in southeastern Afghanistan, also a linguist who served honorably, he's there with his family. I think it's a moral obligation it's a moral imperative for us as, as, a, as a nation to assist the folks that we promised to help, particularly interpreters and, interpreters and translators. They were young, they were impressionable, they, they embraced the opportunity to have a job, but most importantly to serve their country. And by serving their, their country to further American, uh, assist with American uh, war efforts in Afghanistan, they, imp they embraced American ideals wholeheartedly for us. Unfortunately, the fact that they are still there, for a country like the United States, that, that, that sets a terrible precedent, that for people who would be willing to assist US efforts around the world in the future, if they experience half of what the Afghans who are left behind are experiencing, I sincerely doubt that they will consider helping or working with the United States. And I live by that ethos. And, not a single day goes by for me not to reflect on the plight of my friend who's watching this feed right now because I promised him that I will talk about him. He's, he's an army specialist, served honorably. Um, so I, we have a moral obligation to help him. If we can get him to the United States immediately, that's understandable because of the political dynamics in the country and it's probably going to change over the years. We have a moral obligation to assist him leave Afghanistan, seek safety, anywhere, honestly, anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to be the United States. The United States have, has the leverage with countries in Europe, in Asia, in South America to resettle these folks because they have genuinely given it their all. And the very minimum we can do is give them an opportunity to live elsewhere. We don't need to provide them financial support. We just need to get them out of the harm's way out of Afghanistan. If they don't get killed by the Taliban tomorrow or the next day, they're ostracized, they're branded traitors for the rest of their lives. And that brand will go with them for the rest of their lives and their kids' lives. Because they genuinely have given, their, given it their all. And we owe it to them. And as veterans as yourself, Tam, who served in Afghanistan, there's a certain camaraderie that forms during, during war times among allies. And 
those linguists who are the most heroic people I've ever worked with. And we see this where you know families are of mixed immigration status, the way that current immigration policy is, and you can't ask a family to, some of them come, some of them get to safety while leaving behind young adult siblings or aunts and uncles, you know, so that's, that's the challenge that we face with a lot of um, the translator families that we're trying to help is, you know, they, they shouldn't be asked to make a decision to leave parts of your family group behind because people fall in different Im immigration statuses. Absolutely, in a country, a close-knitted society like Afghanistan where families take priority for everyone, the conduct of a single member of the family reflects on the entire family. So if, if one helps with, with, with uh, our war efforts in Afghanistan, the entire family is held responsible for that, for that conduct, what is branded as traitor now. The, I mean, the entire family has to contend with, with, contend with, with, that, uh, with that disrepute that the daughter or son has brought, brought to the household. So by, by the fact that they have helped with the war efforts, they have put their lives because the Taliban will not distinguish between the individual who wasn't a linguist, his father or his brother, or any other members of their family. We look at all, them all the same, if not as a direct uh, participant, but at least as, a, as accessory to war, US war efforts. And um, I, th I think that should be taken into account. Under normal circumstances, I think immigration laws are incredibly important, but I think these are extraordinary circumstances where we can wave them. And I know there are concerns about security vetting. I can say this because I have been through four or five polygraph, te polygraph tests myself, and I've been interviewed by counterintelligence individuals probably more than 10 times in my life. We are probably the most vetted people on this planet. And they've, they've been through that. And I know some people use that as an excuse where they are allowed to come, you know, the, the security uh, check hasn't happened. As someone who has been through that, I can assure you, that we get vetted very thoroughly. And Probably more trustworthy than members of Congress and former members of Congress, <laughs> I, I would think, in this environment. Uh, let, let me ask, um, the, the, well, let me actually give Mariah an opportunity to, uh, to talk about how we can support her organization. Now, we are taping live, uh, and I'm told that the link will be made available to the the folks who registered for this immediately after this conversation. So for those folks, Mariah, this is your opportunity uh, to talk about how we can support uh, your work and your organization, and then we'll move on to other questions. Certainly, and, and thank you, sir. Um, so our organization, No One Left Behind, nooneleft.org, um, as we assist Afghan and Iraqi translator families, we've been providing direct financial assistance once they arrive here in the U.S. Um, families do receive a certain amount of government benefits. However, um, because the amount of time that families are going through processing and being held um, in U.S. bases um, and the resettlement agencies are overwhelmed, we see a lag where they're not being picked up by a resettlement agency because things are spread so thin, so they're trying to find affordable housing, which is a crisis throughout the United States. Um, to find meaningful employment, um, and even access to a vehicle. So two of the things that we provide um, to SIV families is emergency rent to supplement the, the housing benefits that they receive uh, from a resettlement agency, and then access to a good used vehicle, because we see that as one of the quickest, most efficient things to provide access to employment and to start taking care of your family. You can earn income, you can get yourself to employ uh, appointments, that type of thing. So uh, the number one uh, grant that we give out right now is, is for, for used vehicles. Um, so if, if anyone chooses to help <laughs> uh, in that aspect, that's primarily what it'll be going to is um, emergency rent and used vehicles. We also help sometimes with um, medical assistance. We see that particularly children make it here to the US. They had chronic conditions that weren't treated in Afghanistan. They didn't have access to health care, and they need almost immediate um, access to good health care to, to be treated for a chronic condition once they arrive. Um, and then we do um, do advocacy. So 
legislation that needs to be enacted to, to bring more of our allies here, to make the process uh, work better and more efficiency. You know, we're working with members of Congress, we're working within the administration to raise the understanding for everything that, that you, your partners, your family have done to serve the United States, you know, to serve your country, um, why you deserve to be here, why you deserve to be uh, in safety and to have a future. And the website address again is? Yes, noonelept.org. Noonelept.org. Farid, um, what do you hear from your contacts about the environment in Afghanistan right now? The stories I hear are beyond terrible and beyond description. What we hear in the US media is a snippet of what's happening in the country. The most horrible, ter terrible events of the assassination, the torture of former Afghan government, uh, uh, particularly the military folks the, uh, and other human rights activists, what happens outside the major cities, the cosmopolitan cities like Kabul, that goes un unreported. Because the Taliban have a pretty pervasive presence throughout the country. Daily assassination, daily disappearances, daily tortures, and the stories are ubiquitous and in hundreds on daily basis. We have a very small window of what we hear from Afghanistan, and that's from what's happening in Kabul, because the younger generation, they're used to technology, they can, they can report events live. But outside where access to technology is limited, that's where most of the terrible events are taking place. On a daily basis, there are reports of up to hundreds of former Afghan uh, uh, military, the army or the police folks are, are being assassinated and tortured in the most terrible ways. And that is soul crushing for anyone who's been there because these are the folks that who stood next to us for the last 20 years and they have genuinely given it, given it their all. And that's what the Afghan news is basically on a daily basis. Sadly, as an Afghan, it pains me the most to say this, is that I don't really see a particularly bright or hopeful future for the country at this point. The way the Taliban have been treating the general population is beyond description. It's draconian will be an understatement. And they're trying to push the entire country back to the Stone Age. Right, and, and you stood behind these folks as well. How does that make you feel? Um, I was also working evacuation efforts, uh, you know, in, in August and July um, and into September and still. Um, and while I didn't have my own immediate family that I was trying to get out, you had a community of thousands and thousands of veterans um, that, I mean, we saw it as um, an imperative. It was a compulsion to continue to try and get our comrades out. And there was this sense of loss. You know, you invested, I invested all my 20s and 30s, as did you, um, in the war on terror. And then just to see, you know, it just kind of wrapped up into part, you know, and we left, um, we left things unfinished. We left behind, um, you know, our allies that we worked with. Um, and it's so painful to see this, you know, this future that has now become uncertain um, for a whole generation of Afghans. Um, you've been an incredible example uh, with the, what you've achieved, with your education um, that you've achieved here in the US. Um, and I think I, I grieve for like what the young Afghans right now don't have, are not gonna have access to, to education. Do you think there's anything that, that we can do, particularly when it comes to providing access to education? Are there things that we can still do despite the current environment in the country to assist Americans and, and people in other countries? Well, I want to take the, this opportunity to thank my fellow veterans uh, for, uh, in all the branches. They have been incredible over the course of the last several months. For instance, my Cornell Veteran Friends, the Cornell Undergraduate Veterans Association, they have been incredibly helpful over the past, whether it was giving, whether it's texting me or calling me to just check on, 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 on my family's situation. They have gone above and beyond their, their job. And uh, in terms of assistance to Afghan kids in Afghanistan, I think the COVID pandemic has also presented it. So, so other opportunities too, that is working via Zoom. I think we can always bypass 
the Taliban draconian uh, methods of teaching kids. We can dial classes via Zoom where they will not be monitored or we can freely teach them about whether it's coding or English language or history or philosophy or music or, or, or any other subject. I think we have an opportunity and I think we have plenty of mobilized veterans who I'm very proud of um, have taken on that call. And I think Zoom or uh, through other social media uh, 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 platforms, recorded classes or live classes are an incredible way of making sure that we ensure that Afghan kids who are, who are still in Afghanistan have a way to or, or, or can reach uh, you know, educational uh, sources. We have about 10 minutes left. What are your plans? Not tonight, but <laughs> <laughs> beyond. Uh, I should, my family should be completely settled down in Rochester hopefully next week. The goal is for me to go back to, to preparing for the LSAT and hopefully applying to law school for next year. My goal is to ensure that I continue my effort in helping the folks that we left behind and also tell an American story, a story of success, not because of me, but it's because of a number of people that made it happen. I owe this moment to folks like Tim Mueller or yourself, sir, for getting my papers to the folks that could do something, or Colonel, uh, for your service, for giving, giving the Afghan girls in Afghanistan uh, being a model for them, really, that, 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 that a female can be a lieutenant colonel, can lead a battalion of, of, of people. Uh, my goal is to, to, to try to live an American life as much as I fully can and, and be grateful for the opportunities that are, that are given to me. And also, reminding people the good that we can do and we have done as, as individuals. If you have an opportunity to assist an Afghan family in your neighborhood, be a mentor. It doesn't have to be a financial assistance. Just be a simple mentor. Take them to, to shopping for a day or assist them with, with preparing for their driving tests or just simple other, other simple American activities. My success is because of people who took that time to assist me to get here. And I think every Afghan who, who's moved to the United States has that potential and more, and they will, they will be great Americans. I have no doubt about that. If I may, we, we can open it up to questions. If anybody has a question, raise your hand. Yes, sir. Who's facilitating movement out now? Um, it is the State Department is managing um, the the movement, the evacuation of Afghans out of Afghanistan. They're they're focusing first on uh, green card holders, legal permanent residents, people with um, their SIVs that are completed, and then it's supplemented. Um, there's I mean it's there's attempts and efforts. Um, to get people who don't fall into those categories, um, but you know, are family members of SIVs or journalists or were in the Afghan army or the Afghan police force or the Afghan government um, to assist them in getting perhaps to a safe location like um, Pakistan and then onward somewhere. But, but right now, um, there are not that many fast options for Afghans at risk to, to leave Afghanistan. Uh, there's there's still a um, a groundswell evacuation effort by multiple organizations, like you said, nonprofits, private contractors. Just uh, for those, for because we are taping, uh, the gentleman says that fifty two thousand is a, is a lot of people. And we were never told that this number was going to get that. And we were never told uh, that you don't have a mic, so forgive me for repeating. We were never told that uh, the numbers were any, anywhere near that. Yeah. Mm hmm. Is said. Uh, if I may, ask both of our special guests this evening. Three tours in Afghanistan, one tour in Iraq. Grew up in Afghanistan, okay. served our nation. When you take a look at today's news, what's happened in Ukraine, off topic, but I, I, I feel an obligation to ask, uh, how do you feel about it? What do you think the United States should be doing? Or are we doing everything we can? Let me begin with Farid and then go through Mariah, if I may. 
there is a groundswell of support for the Ukrainians among the Afghan community. Mm. Because we, pay, we feel their pain, we know what they're going through, we know what it means to leave everything behind. Because a neighbor has, has the, wants to take over your country, takes, takes over your livelihood. I follow this Afghan social media closely and I see this incredible support for the Ukrainians and what they're going through. We feel their pain and we sympathize with them. We support them in any way and every way possible. At the same time, for our American friends here, not to forget Afghanistan too. Unfortunately, there's this, this unfortunate pattern for Afghanistan. When the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down a couple of years later, so Afghanistan was removed from the headlines where there was an opportunity for the world to be engaged in that process. And then after September 11 and America, coalition troops arrival in Afghanistan, the, the war in Iraq happened and Afghanistan was taken off of the, the headlines again. And with the unfortunate events in Ukraine, I just hope the same doesn't happen to, to our Afghan allies and partners who are left behind. Or in general, as, as Afghans who are, who are living the horrors of the Taliban regime for, for, for the world not to forget their, uh, their um, uh, terrible conditions. All right. Um, it's you know, incredibly painful to watch what is going on in Ukraine right now because you know, we equate it with um, you know, the cruelty that, that Afghanistan is going through. You know, families are at risk. Um, they're trying to leave. They're being separated. You know, their lives are in danger. Um, I know myself, a lot of other veterans, we've had this discussion, like we wish we were there, like helping, you know, that's how you feel. You wanna like get in the fight. You wanna put your hands on, um, you know, and try and rescue people and help. Like that's our ethos, that's what we do. Um, you can't tolerate that type of cruel aggression. I mean, I, I think it is our um, obligation, you know, as a, you know, a nation that is a world leader um, to protect and to assist people that are fighting for their very existence, whether it's Afghans, whether it's Ukrainians, you know, people that we have asked a lot of and, and been partners with uh, for years. I'm a big believer in historic parallels. Uh, Mariah knows when she w uh, from her work uh, with me that uh, I never pretend to be the smartest member of Congress, although the competition may not have been that stiff, but I uh, consider myself to be one of the most serious students of, of history in Congress, uh, and particularly military history. And there's a, a chilling historic parallel emerging, uh, and that is that Ukraine, Ukraine could be analogous to, the, to uh, Russia to the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Uh, I, over the short term, I'm, I'm uh, pessimistic, despite everything we see and everything we hear, the Russian military is, uh, has a superiority uh, over the Ukrainians. I'm not sure how the, the, the short term will end, but I believe the long term will be quite optimistic, that it could Absolutely. be the same kind of ruinous occupation uh, and ultimate defeat for Russia that they experienced in uh, Afghanistan. Is that a possibility, do you believe? Absolutely, sir. I, I strongly believe in that sentiment myself, too, because the Ukrainians are highly motivated. Mm -hmm. They love their homeland, and it, there, seems to be a, there seems to be an international solidarity with their efforts, and I believe in the long term they will prevail. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind, because the Russian military has proven over the course of last several weeks that it is not a blitzkrieg that mm -hmm. they can take over the country in the course of a week or two. I think in the long term, uh, the, the Ukrainian people will absolutely be victorious. There is no doubt in my mind. Uh, there will be a lot of, they, they, I'm sure they will give a lot of sacrifice to ensure that, uh, that they are free at um, some time to come. Mariah Smith, thank you for your service to the United States. Thank you for your service in my congressional <laughs> office. You, you made us smarter about military issues. And we're so grateful to you. The website address one more time for the organization. For No One Left Behind, it is noonelept.org. And in addition to resettlement and advocacy, we remain involved in the evacuation effort. Farid Ferdos, you are an American hero. And we thank you for everything that you have done. And our obligation is to do for you. I appreciate thank it. you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, for more information about the Institute of Politics at Cornell University, uh, the, Bro the Cornell University Brooks 
Institute of Politics and Global Affairs. You can go to iopga.cornell.edu uh, or just Google Cornell Institute of Politics. March 14th at 1 o'clock, former CIA Director John Brennan. Uh, on March 22nd, Huma Abedin uh, on her book, Both End, A Life in Many Worlds. And uh, please stay in touch with us. Check the website. Uh, we will be reporting a date for the former Prime Minister uh, of Great Britain, uh, Gordon Brown, who will be discussing his efforts to marshal uh, international sanctions and, uh, and prosecution of Vladimir Putin uh, and other Russians. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Mariah. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Perfect. I think it's so wonderful. We have to do much more together. Great job. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, sir.